Thank you so much. This is the African History Class. And today I'm taking you all the way from Gabon to the country known as Mexico. And we're going to be talking about a man whose life is going to blow you away. Today we're talking about Gaspar Yanga. Gaspar Yonga. And Gaspar Yanga is spelled Gaspar goes G A S P A R. And Yanga is Y A N G A. Now, Gaspar Yanga was born in Gabon on the 14th of May in 1545. Gaspar Yanga was born in Gabon, present day Gabon, on the 14th day of May in 1545. In fact, he was a very powerful African youth as he was growing up, full of muscles and energy. In fact, he was so powerful, even right at birth, he could go alone into the jungle and come every time with something very wonderful for his family. His family was also from the royal home, and for that matter, they were grooming him quietly to become a king later in life. But he loved hunting. He would go into the jungles of Gabon and would always come back with game. Sometimes he would come out with fruits that nobody in the village had ever tasted. Wonderful wild fruits. And he would convince them that these fruits were edible. Oh, the young ladies in the area loved him. He was growing up into a fine gentleman. And they wanted him. As the family was getting ready, grooming him rigorously to become the next king of the area. In fact, the small village he lived in, something interesting happened. He was a member of the royal family of Gabon. And what happened? He was captured and sold into slavery in Mexico where they changed his name to Gaspar Yanga. His original name was Nyanga. Nyanga. Y-N-A-N-G-A. -N -N Nyanga. Pronounce Nyanga. Repeat after me, students. Nyanga. Nyanga. Right. He was simply called Nyanga. And interestingly, when he was captured and sent into slavery, his name was changed from Nyanga to Gaspar Yanga because the white man could not pronounce his name Nyanga. So it became Yanga. Captured into slavery in Mexico. Oh my God. He soon realized that the area where they were keeping them as slaves became very, very notorious for slavery abuse, murder, and even rape. They had about 200,000 slaves in the area. And where was this? Now, before the end of the slave trade, New Spain had become the sixth highest slave population. Estimated 200,000 slaves of the Americas after Brazil. Brazil had 4.9 million slaves. I remember yesterday we spoke about Brazil. Oh my God, have mercy. It was a very, very, very fertile ground for slavery. And also slave revolts. Today we are not talking about Brazil, we're talking about Mexico. When our hero Inyanga, a.k.a. Gaspar Yanga, arrived in Mexico at the time known as New Spain, he realized that there was a huge number of Africans who had come there, in fact, who had been forced there as slaves. Now, Cuba at the time also had one million slaves. And of course, the United States of America alone had about half a million slaves. But Mexico at the time, called New Spain, had about 200,000 slaves. And he saw the abuse going on. In fact, in 1570, 1570, when our hero was only 25 years old, 
he escaped from his master into the highlands just around Veracruz. And Veracruz is also part of Mexico. He escaped from his master and found himself on the mountains of Veracruz. Whilst he was there, number one, he realized that he was lonely. And number two, he knew some people from his village in Gabon who were still in slavery and decided that he would single-handedly start a state slave revolt to be able to free his fellow Africans. What did he do? Late in the night, he would sneak from the tops of the mountains and come down into the slave plantations and start talking to a few slaves who he trusted and taking them one after the other, planning that, yes, there was going to be a huge slave revolt. Very soon, he was able to speak to a number of the slaves so that they would start a rebellion in order not to to make the slave master suspect any movement, he only went into the slave plantations in the night. Yanga would make sure that all the slaves understood the plan. And what was the plan? They staged a certain date that the rebellion was supposed to happen. In the interim, they were supposed to take all the guns quietly from the slave master. One after the other, they would use the slave master's own guns to fight the slave master and be able to free themselves. This was the plan. So circa 1570, Gaspar Yanga decided that it would be time to stake the revolt. He had already taught his people how to handle the gun. All his night visits, he used those as training days and times. And he made sure that everybody was ready for this revolt. The rebellion was about to start. Mm, 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 mm. So by 1609, 1609, there was a huge group made up of about 500 men who were ready for this revolt. And boom, they were out fighting night and day, shooting and killing so that they could free themselves. And that was what happened. My brother, my sister, they were able to fight their way out of slavery. And then they went all the way up on the mountains of Veracruz. And there they established a maroon village of so many hundreds of uh, escaped slaves. And that was the beginning of the independence of the slaves. <laughs> In fact, the revolt started somewhere in 1570, just after uh, Gaspar Yanga himself broke free from the slave master. And then he took time off to come down and train more people to be part of it. And by 1609, the slave village was already big and huge. So many of them were in there, thousands of them. And how did they survive? They survived by hijacking a lot of caravans that were coming in to provide food to the Spanish at that time. They knew the history and they also knew the geography of the area. So what did they do? They knew where to attack and when to attack. And they always had food. Now they also took to farming, that's agriculture, to be able to grow their own food. They also took to animal rearing, and in no time, the whole Maroon village founded by Gaspar Yamga, oh my God, was bubbling hot. Now, Gaspar Yamga's Maroons did not only plunder the haciendas and farms within their reach in order to survive, they also attacked some other villages where the Spaniards took control and whatever they could find, they took that. Now these attacks were worrisome for the authorities. So they decided that they had to attack the Maroon village. So they got fresh guns and ammunition from Spain and they started to attack the Maroon village. But every time they tried, they suffered huge casualties 
because they were on top of the mountains and all they did was to roll down big stones on them and fire at them. Remember they had their guns and they had ammunition. Anytime they got shot of ammunition, they would raid some of the villages and take ammunition and even guns and take some of the Spaniards captive and even make them slaves to work for them on top of the mountains for them to taste slavery. Now in 1609, when the Maroon village founded by Gaspar Yanga had reached the top of its power, something happened. News spread that the Africans intended to kill the inhabitants of the capital and crown one of their own known as Yanga, king. And they decided that it was time to attack them finally and make sure that the Maroon village was totally broken down. And this time around, they decided to come with full power and energy. They fought and fought. At that time, Gaspar Yanga was already old. Remember, he was born in uh, 1545. And by 1609, how old was he? My brother, my sister, he was already 64 years. Heading towards 70. He was quite old and weak. And he decided that there should be a peace treaty. At that time, he had already captured a number of Spaniards and enslaved them. And the agreement was that, listen, free all our African slaves. And we would also give you your Spaniards. But the Spaniards said no, they would not. Because slavery was their business and they did not want to lose, in fact, their goods. Because they referred to Africans as goods. Yes, they did not want to lose their chattels. So the fighting continued. A lot of the Maroons lost their lives. But the Spaniards suffered more casualties. Gradually, they found themselves on top of the mountain where they were engaged in single combat. A lot of Spaniards got killed. In fact, they fired shots until all their ammunition ran out. Now they had to use manpower. That was where the Spaniards suffered more because the Africans were stronger. They broke the necks of the Spaniards, broke their limbs, and threw them from the top of the mountains all the way down, crushing them. <laughs> Finally, they decided to agree to the truce. But at the time, Gaspar Yanga also refused. He said, we gave you the opportunity to sign a peace treaty with us. But you disagreed. You came into our village, burnt down some of our houses, killed some of us. In fact, it will hurt all the people who killed. Their souls and their spirits will fight us. Especially that you decided not to agree to the truce and decided to fight and kill. Let us continue fighting. Oh my God. Gaspar Yanga refused. They fought and fought and killed a number of the Spaniards until they decided that no, this was a maroon village they could never ever conquer. So they ran down the mountains and never ever attempted to climb the mountain again. My brother, my sister, Gaspar Yanga was able to free all the Africans from the plantation one after the other. And the Spaniards were now afraid to bring in more slaves because they knew that Gaspar Yanga would come down and free the slaves again. And with the superior military power and tactics, the Spaniards never ever tried to sign any peace treaty with him again because he made it clear that he was not ready for any peace treaty again. Now, other slave plantations that were close to the Veracruz had heard about the power and the might of Gaspar Yanga. And those who were able to escape from other areas came all the way to the tops of the mountains right there where Gaspar Yanga was the king. In fact, Gaspar Yanga grew old and weak. He died in 1618. 
He died in 1618. My brother, my sister, yes, he died in 1618 at the age of about 74. And when he died, the whole Maroon village wept tears of sorrow. They kept him alive by mourning him. In fact, they laid him down and they prayed for several days, hoping that he will come back to life again. Younger never dies. Younger never dies. Younger never dies. They prayed and chanted. They brought together all their African power and uh, energy, praying and praying, praying that Gaspar Younger will rise from the dead because people like Gaspar Younger do not die. They prayed and prayed and prayed, but he never came to life again. <laughs> He died, my brother, my sister. And when he died, oh my God have mercy, the Maroon village chose a new king. They continued to stay there until the abolition of slavery. Nobody was able to take them down again because they had such a strong reputation that they were unconquerable. <laughs> In 1871, five decades after the Mexican independence, Yanga was designated as a national hero of Mexico. Today, when you go to Mexico, Gaspar Yanga is a national hero, the African who liberated other Africans, the African who stood against slavery and single-handedly fought the Spanish and conquered them on every occasion. Gaspar Yanga is a national hero in Mexico. In fact, they call him El Prima Libertadado. I take it again. El Prima Libertado. That is the first liberator de la America of the Americas in Spanish. My brother, my sister. Now, this was based largely on an account by historian Vicente Riva Palacio that this man single-handedly chased the Spanish out of Mexico. There have been movies made in the past and even short stories and documentaries made about the powerful life of Gaspar Yanga. Today we remember you, Papa. Papa, we remember you. And we say, Damil Fadio, Papa. Papa Uninyaminko Gaspar Yanga Uninyaminko Wate Uninyaminko 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 Oh In the burden of knowledge I ask you Now that you know what you do Be an eni o leye mini o bafe Ye zunde kagane me zaka yini Ye en pa bango buka ye nang Fifi ya ye nyanu kai na wo Ba na ye hu ebe den Lele enji ma singa be kone Lele Anjima Singa Beri. How will the life of Gaspar Yanga impact your own life in present days? How will the life of Gaspar Yanga impact your own life in these times? This is the African history class. And my name, Black Rasta. <laughs> Papa mula ho meo, mama mula ho meo, hao na ima vinye.